I'm Jim Haskell, Senior Portfolio Strategist. Earlier this autumn, we collaborated with one of our clients on a multi-part exploration of U.S.-China relations. I'm excited to introduce a three-part series that will run over the next couple of weeks through the Bridgewater Daily Observations on the different dimensions of the U.S.-China relationship and their implications for investors. Joining me in this series are three people with extensive experience in the U.S.-China realm. I welcome Ray Dalio, our founder and co-CIO, Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, and David McCormick, our CEO and a former senior official in the Treasury and Commerce Departments, as well as the National Security Council in the George W. Bush administration. The conversations you will see in this series are drawn from a video cast with Ray, Kevin, and David, and from a live session with our client, which was captured on audio. Excerpts from these two sessions will make up the content for this series. Throughout this series, you will hear us refer to three different scenarios for how the relationship could evolve. First, a high friction scenario, similar to the current path of increased tensions. Second, a lower friction scenario, wherein the two countries reach a sort of detente. And third, an unlikely scenario marked by major reforms to China's policies and a return to the engagement model of the past decades. In part one, Ray, Kevin, and David discussed the arc of the U.S.-China relationship, how we got to this point, and where it might go from here. In this video, Ray, Kevin, and David survey the domains of economic competition between the U.S. and China, and they consider how trade, technology, and capital control policies may change in the coming decade. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Kevin, under a high-friction U.S.-China scenario, how did the trade relations between China and the United States evolve? And what about China and the rest of the world? Um, probably to give it a single word, a haiku or even more acute haiku summary, the word is badly. And that is trade is usually the first casualty of uh, international uh, political friction and geostrategic tension, um, unless of course you're dealing in the arms trade itself or in critical energy uh, markets. Beyond those sectors, however, uh, the overall impact of geopolitics when it gets uh, extremely tense uh, is to see the arteries of global trade begin to shrink. I think that's reasonably uh, demonstrable through general economic history. And if we want a more recent example, then heightened geopolitical tensions between China and the United States over the last several years have in fact contributed uh, to uh, an overall um, contraction in the uh, vibrancy of uh, the US-China trade. And of course, more broadly, geopolitical tensions combined with the mechanicalism of the US administration in particular has led to a contraction in the growth of global trade. So geopolitics has been alive and well in resulting in not just a contraction in, geo in bilateral trade, but in global trade over the last several years. David, would you agree with Kevin that we're likely to see trade relations grow more strained? Yeah, I think um, I, I think it's it, it really is a continuum, but the short answer is yes. I think we'll um, see a more restrictive posture from the U.S. perspective, and um, whether it's a high friction or, or low to medium friction scenario. And again, so, sorry to keep referring back to history, but I think the history is important here. I think just objectively, if you looked at China's WTO with succession in 2001, and then you look at the, at the subsequent efforts that were pursued by, by uh, multiple administrations, the goal was very much to work with China um, as a way to get market access, to give China an opportunity to engage with the global economy. A big piece of that has not come to fruition in the way that um, uh, the way the United States had hoped, in the way that uh, policymakers on both sides of the aisle had hoped, and in Congress and the, and the White House. And so what you're seeing now is a refactoring of that reality, uh, a recognition that uh, during that period from 2001 until now, about 20 years, China's growth has been remarkable. Um, the economy has really uh, evolved in many of the ways that we had all hoped. And now China poses a real challenge to US leadership, not only in economic terms, but also in terms of some of these leading industries and leading technologies. And so what you see is a more, a more humbled approach uh, to uh, our level of engagement going forward. And there are some dimensions of that that are evolutionary and I think widely understood, and there are some new developments that are worth, worth noting. 
But I think what that's going to mean is a much higher premium and concern on, uh, on those critical emergent technologies, a much higher recognition of China's uh, indigenous capability, uh, a much uh, stronger bias to quid pro quo kinds of thinking where market access in the United States is predicated on market access in China, which is really not the way it has historically been over the last 20, decade, 20 years, at least not consistently. And I think the new thing that's been introduced by the Trump administration is a reliance on tariffs uh, as a means for creating pressure and leverage in those discussions. That'll be an interesting thing to watch uh, going forward is how pervasive tariffs are, are used uh, going forward. What are the political dynamics and consequences of that in the United States? They've, uh, they've certainly had very significant consequences for certain industries. What sort of impact uh, will they have on the Chinese side? And are they a leveraged tool that actually has uh, real benefit? And how sustainable are they over time? And so that's, um, that's the one uncertainty that I think is largely driven by politics and who's in office uh, in the period going forward. Uh, but I do think it's going to be a much more constrained relationship for, for all the reasons I described. David, you mentioned the competition over technology. I want to turn our attention now to that area of competition between the two countries. If we put ourselves in the year 2030 and we look back over the past decade in a high friction scenario, how does the technological competition actually evolve? You know, there's been an evolution. When I was uh, in the government in 2005, 2006, the primary conversation as it related to Chinese technology was around its dependence, China's dependence on the United States and intellectual property protection of US firms, export controls um, to protect against China um, taking uh, US technology through supplier relationships and so forth. Um, those are still concerns, but the whole focus within China and, and risk have changed because I think it's in, indisputable that in the last decade or more, China has developed a much more indigenous capability in, in terms of technology development. And because of uh, some of the dynamics of uh, R&D and government investment and so forth, and the scale and size of the economy have made real breakthroughs that have been independent and autonomous of the United States or anybody else in terms of technology adoption, technology breakthroughs, and, um, and technology leadership. And so we're in a different world where China is no longer dependent on others as much as it was from a technology perspective. And the ambition that President Xi has laid out and the CCP has laid out in its 2025 plan and in, in other parts of, uh, of its agenda is doubling down on that technology leadership. That has huge implications for the relationship because those technologies have, as I said, some winner-take-all dynamics. So if you're the United States, you don't want uh, those technologies uh, controlled by China. If you're in China uh, and Chinese leadership, you don't want those technologies controlled uh, by the United States. And, um, and it's very much uh, an open question of which model, the United States model or the China, China's model, will prevail uh, in this race for leadership in emerging technologies. To continue down this path, Kevin, do you expect both countries to have fully decoupled from a technology perspective by the year 2030? And how do you believe the technological competition will play out across the global south in the emerging world? I believe on the balance of probabilities, given China's national strategy of national self-reliance in critical technology areas, um, wherever that is technologically achievable, that that would have occurred. Where it is not technologically achievable, for example, the continuing gap in China's ability to develop uh, the most advanced semiconductors uh, in the world, uh, then, of course, the Chinese will carve out exceptions. But the inference that it is only America's decision to decouple technologically is a flawed assumption. China is of itself, uh, right now, making a series of internal decisions about not leaving itself vulnerable to global technology markets and systems. And in fact, the semiconductor example is often used in the Chinese domestic debate more broadly across technology and across finance. 
about the undesirability of China remaining vulnerable to these ultimate instruments of American economic power. So the answer to your question is yes, um, but driven as much by Chinese strategy as by American strategy. And the caveat and the carve-out being, except those areas where China cannot technologically achieve it. David, so far, capital markets have been largely exempt from the ongoing economic competition. We have not seen extensive restrictions on investments out of the U.S. or on capital market access in the U.S. Do you think that would change over the next 10 years? The thing that's evolving, and it's very difficult from the U.S. side, uh, from where I sit on the U.S. side, to know whether this is sort of near-term election politics or what I'm about to describe marks a fundamental shift in how the United States thinks about such things. But what you see, what you used to see with with great clarity was very targeted, segmented um, policy responses around very specific technologies um, and very specific markets that had implications for national security or global significance, and a, and a, a focus on restrictions on our interactions with China to protect those things. What you now see a shift toward are much broader sets of restrictive economic policies in terms of the, the breadth of the economic relationship. For example, um, recently there was a, a statement put out uh, by, the, uh, by the, the current administration, which by the way, as I said, this growing uh, aggressiveness and growing concern over China is very much a bipartisan issue. But to refer to this particular policy, it was guidance to uh, university endowments um, to um, be very wary of investing in China. China more broadly, not specific companies, not specific technologies. Um, you see that in the, uh, in the debate over the uh, federal pension plan. Um, you see this in a much broader discussion around uh, foreign investment in the United States from China, where it used to be very targeted around specific transactions through the CFIUS process that would get extra scrutiny because of the national security implications. Now there's a much broader discussion around simply letting China invest in the United States. If you play that out through its logical extension and you really do have a disentanglement of those two economies um, where the trading relationships are are, are much smaller or non-existent, where the ability to have, um, uh, have uh, US companies based in China uh, and vice versa, um, that's, a, that's a huge shift uh, in the global economy. It's a huge shift in how US businesses and Chinese businesses have viewed one another in terms of opportunity. It's a huge shift in terms of supply chain and capital flows. And so I'm not sure whether what we're seeing is some incremental signaling and toughening on the margin in an election year, and then no matter who wins in November, um, we'll have more modest policy measures, or what we're really seeing is a, is, a, is a divergence from some of the underlying premises that have guided US-China relationships from the US perspective, where having China be part of the global economy and being an integrated partner of the United States with all the caveats and restrictions um, is now being called into question. Turning to Ray and Kevin, in terms of capital market developments in China, if you have continuing tension over the next decade, would China take steps to cut off foreign investment or capital coming into its own country? On incoming capital, the Chinese dilemma is this. It is, over time, becoming a net capital importing economy. Um, that's because structurally there is emerging uh, a current account deficit. And therefore, under those circumstances, China is going to need to be able to raise uh, international capital through one market or another. China currently is placing much priority in Hong Kong, but the $6,000 question there is, well, what will happen to the future status of Hong Kong as a international capital market in which the rest of the international economy continues to have confidence, both legally, politically, and in terms of geopolitical risk? So therefore, you look beyond that to the other candidates, Singapore, uh, you look to uh, Tokyo, you look to London. Uh, in the case of uh, Tokyo, uh, because of the closeness of the US-Japan relationship anchored in security, China is unlikely to have confidence in that market. If you look to London, uh, there is a separate question about the UK's traditional close affiliation uh, with the United States as well. Although um, when you look at Singapore, with greater potentiality, 
But of course, on these questions, Singapore is still in net terms rather small. So I think you may in fact see uh, a Chinese play in relation to continental Europe itself and whether in fact uh, Germany could become and Frankfurt become a greater source for international capital raisings for the, uh, for the Chinese, uh, for the, ch for China's economic needs long term. On the capital restriction side, that is outflow, this has been a perennial problem for China in terms of a lack of confidence on the part of its high wealth um, individuals, but in addition to that, it's more successful private corporations who have exhibited a less than robust confidence in China's domestic economic model and or the personal security of high profile private sector investors and entrepreneurs. And so what from time to time the Chinese have done in a Marxist-Leninist uh, system is simply impose hardline capital controls in order to maintain their overall balance uh, for their um, current account purposes. And therefore, under those circumstances, I think in a high-risk, uh, highly competitive environment in the future, you would still see the real and continuing risk of the Chinese system uh, imposing capital controls in the future as they've done in the past. I believe that a Chinese response to that, now I'm not certain about this, but I do believe, a Chinese response to that would not be to curtail, um, to respond to um, adversely to American businesses or, or American or foreign, let's call them foreign, any foreign investment in the country. Because um, if you look at the rises and declines of empires. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen the, my piece, The Changing World Order, but if you look at the, that and you look at the arc of the Dutch Empire and the British Empire and so on, one of the key things in terms of its development of a reserve currency and also development of it as an empire is to have a um, financial center that becomes one of the world's financial center. So the development of the currency as a, uh, as a world currency, reserve currency, the development of a financial center, the development of capital markets in China is very important to its development as an arc. And so capital can get scared very easily. Um, if you do the wrong things uh, to capital, uh, it can do, um, it can lose all that. And then there's the individual and the country. Uh, one of the most powerful ways in negotiation um, is to uh, deal with the individual companies or the individuals and have them on your side, China's side, um, as a way of affecting um, the policies of the government. And for those reasons, um, I don't think we're going to see any reaction um, on China's part to discourage capital flows into the country and so on. I think it'll move more toward um, the evolutionary course of uh, developing uh, reserve currency. I don't think the China wants to threaten the U.S. reserve currency status. I think the United States threatens its own reserve currency status more than China threatens its status by some of the policies that it's doing. Ray elaborated on China's plans to open its capital accounts and increase the global role of the RMB. The audio follows. I think that there are these five or six types of wars and they're all one war and they're all used interchangeably. You know, you, you could see it. Everything relates to sanctions and so on. I will um, say that I know the following to be true here in terms of, let's say, the financial war. We have an administration and that will change and we'll find out what the new administration would bring in terms of the American policies. However, in terms of the financial war, uh, the Chinese have intentionally not been aggressive in the internationalization of the RMB, and that there is a reluctance to do that because that is uh, almost a signal of a threat that they have intentionally not denominated their loans in RMB and not done a number of things that will build the uh, RMB as a reserve currency. So they've actually held it back. And that, um, so I'm now speaking of the capital flows. We have different things, but let's take the capital flows. At the same time, they will now make more moves in that direction, almost out of necessity. You'll, you know, besides the opening of the capital markets, you, you will see 
uh, a plan coming soon for eliminating capital controls or dramatically reducing capital controls. And you're going to see a number of moves on that part to develop. At the same time, the United States is in a financial difficulty. I mean, this has to be part of that picture. How is the United States and the three major reserve currencies, how, what is their viability? And when you're dealing with um, economic viability in this, this is a very important question because if we look forward, how much can the United States literally afford to build up its military and to have these expenditures? So if you look at history. So I think all of these things are markers for each other. In other words, the technology move and so on, you could see the cutting off of exports to each other. All of those five wars each is a marker for each other. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. In the next and final installment of this series, Ray and Kevin will look at the implications of U.S.-China tensions on global markets and for investors, and they'll discuss how Chinese economic policy may evolve. We look forward to sharing that podcast with you.